Well, uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon for those of you, which may be the majority, who are in the UK. Um, it's very good to see you uh, all today. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name's Duncan Edwards. I'm the uh, CEO of British American Business. And it's, uh, it's uh, a real pleasure uh, for me to welcome you today to uh, this um, STIR panel, uh, the STIR being our series on the changing nature of the, of the workplace, uh, during which we're going to talk about belonging, uh, the, the transforming, maintaining um, diversity and inclusion and equality at work, which is, of course, the subject of the book that was uh, published by the three, written by the three authors who are with us today. Um, I should make full disclosure. Um, I've known the three authors, uh, uh, Sue Unaman, Catherine Jacob and Mark Edwards for more than 30 years, uh, giving our uh, ages away a little bit. And um, I was also, uh, second disclosure, I was also a foreword writer uh, to, uh, for this book. Uh, now, some of you may remember we had a discussion, I guess a session with Sue and Catherine 18 months or so ago uh, to coincide uh, with uh, their previous uh, book, Glass Wall, uh, which looked at gender issues in the workplace and belonging, of course, builds on that. And I, I was chatting with, with um, the panel before we, we opened the room and yeah, it's, it's so clear that this issue, and quite right quite rightly is a is now an issue on on the minds of boards of companies everywhere um, and large and small so it's great to have some new thinking about this um, to make uh, full introductions to our panel and to moderate the discussion today I'm very happy to have uh, uh, Frida Lewis with us Frida is the chief commercial diversity officer at uh, Broadridge Financial Solutions and Broadridge is a extremely active member of British American Business and a great supporter of our STIR program. So Frida, thank you very much for your support today and I will pass the moderation over to you. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm based in New York and it's truly a privilege to be able to moderate this panel today as the Chief Commercial Diversity Officer at Broadridge, I emphasize the word commercial because it's not the traditional HR lens. It's truly about how diversity, equity, inclusion drives the bottom line. It's good for business and it's the right thing to do. Um, our panel, as Duncan had mentioned, recently released their new book, belongings, the key to transforming, maintaining diversity, inclusion, and equity at work. And what this book represents is their investigation into DEI in the workplace and a call to action for the corporate leadership to become part of the solution. So without further delay, let me introduce our esteemed panel um, and writers. Um, Sue, why don't you start? Hi, hello, I'm Sue Uleman and I'm Chief Transformation Officer at Mediacom in the UK, which is um, the UK's largest planning and buying organisation. Uh, Catherine? Hello, I'm Catherine Jacob and I'm Chief Executive of Pearl and Dean, which is a cinema advertising company in the UK. And Mark? Hello, I'm uh, Mark Edwards and I'm a trainer and a coach. Uh, I work in the areas of emotional intelligence and mindfulness, and uh, I've spent a lot of time over the last few years coaching individuals for leadership positions who come from the groups previously underrepresented, underrepresented and still underrepresented in leadership positions. Great. So just a quick note to the audience before we begin, um, we will be able, hopefully, to take questions um, either throughout or save it to the end. So there's a chat feature, so feel free to write in, type in your questions. So on that note, let's begin. And you know, when I look at these three writers, they clearly have very, very different backgrounds. So 
how did you come together with your individual journeys to collaborate on this book? And I'm going to let each of you respond. So, Sue, why don't you start? Um, well, this book came about really um, as a natural next step after the writing of The Glass Wall, which we came and did a, a, a brilliant panel, actually. I was, I, in fact, I was saying to Alice um, last week that it's one of the few panels that we've done where the audience has been um, uh, equal in terms of gender. And we wrote The Glass Wall. Actually, it was my boss, my global CEO at Mediacom, Nick Lawson's idea um, before he was a global CEO. I think he was a mere CEO at the time. And um, I had written a previous book, which is about marketing. I was going to um, write a follow up to it. And I asked Nick for his support. And he said, somewhat surprisingly, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, but you should not write that book. You should write a book about women at work. And at the time, so this was in maybe 2014, um, Sharon Sandberg had just published Lean In, which is a very fine book. Um, and I wasn't sure that there was a need for another book. And then I thought about it and I thought about Mediacom at the time. And at the time, Mediacom, which is a business that I have worked at for 30 years, so a long time, all the time I've known Duncan. Um, in fact, Duncan and I go before, but back even further than that. Um, and um, during that time, it's had a very successful run. It started as a tiny buying shop. It's now the biggest in the UK with billings of what, over one and a half billion. And diversity and inclusion is the reason for its success. And at the time of thinking about writing this book, my then CEO was Karen Blackett, who wrote the other foreword, um, who's now a head of Group M in the UK, a holding company. And her exco, so her top senior management, five client facing people, four out of the five of us were women and three out of the four of us worked part time because we looked after our kids um, you know, a day a week. And that's quite extraordinary and very unusual still in our sector, even though advertising is, is, can, can be said to be better than some other sectors in terms of um, women's representation on boards. And I thought about that. I thought about why that was. I mean, Karen not, was also one of the very few black women CEOs of, a, of an advertising agency. And I went to Catherine, who represents difference from me in quite a lot of ways, because I'm very introvert. She's very extrovert. I've always worked at media agencies. She works uh, the other side of the business, uh, media owners, which is still very um, men dominated in, in boardrooms. And we set out to investigate why women weren't getting through to the top of companies. And then after writing that book, we started to notice that we were being asked when we went out and spoke, that we were being asked by women at talks that were predominantly attended by women can I just ask, where are all the men? And the organiser of the talk would usually go, well, this talk wasn't really for men, it was for you, it's for a women's network. And the woman would reply, well, if the men aren't here, if we're not having a conversation with men, how is anything gonna change? We're just speaking to ourselves. And so at this point, Catherine and I got together and thought there's another book here. There's a book that's about why the huge amount of money that's spent on diversity and inclusion initiatives, as you'll know, Frida, why they haven't got a return on investment that's quite satisfactory to any of us yet. And this isn't just about gender, it is about all forms of underrepresented groups as Mark's already mentioned. So Catherine and I set out to write this new book on that basis, but as in a build again on, on the glass wall, we wanted to make it really detailed in terms of how to create change. And Mark, who, um, is, is my other half as well, has spent so much time working, as he said, and training people in how to have the courage to make those changes in the workplace, how to stage interventions, how to be in the right mindful state in order to create change, that we wanted to collaborate with Mark as well to create um, a book that was genuinely for everybody and that would genuinely have practical and very applicable ways to change the world is our ambition the business world at least I think there's the other point as well Sue which is when we'd written the glass wall I got lots of men coming up to me saying I really want to help but I don't know how 
And it's almost like a guilty secret for some senior men, which is sometimes if they've never seen a talk like ours before we did the glass wall or they'd heard about it or they got feedback, it was almost like this, well, how do I help? I, I don't know. I don't know how to develop empathy for working mothers or or, or young women. How, how you know, it, I definitely, in, in one of the cases, as soon as one of the people I, I write about in the book, literally came up to me at a conference and said, you'll probably think I'm part of the problem, but actually I want to be part of the solution. And he's actually in the book as, not entirely because of me, but because of his own volition, he is part of the solution. Mark, any other perspective from um, the individual side? Well, I mean, I guess the reason that I wanted to contribute to the book is that um, I guess through the obstacles I've encountered in the early stages of my career, it was really obvious to me very early on that while I'm, I'm, um, while talents very widely distributed, opportunities are not so widely distributed. And that there are many barriers in the way uh, stopping people with talent rising to the positions they should reach and those barriers don't need to be there and that we can work to remove them and although uh, as we've said a huge amount of money has been spent in this area the progress is very slow and i think that that progress can be speeded up and one of the things and it's only one of the things that could help is as sue and catherine have said is is if the conversation is broadened to include the people who are currently in positions of power or at least look like the people who are in positions of power and that they understand that they've got to get involved too and become part of the conversation. So pre-pandemic, let's go back in time, there's already an increasing understanding that corporate leadership correlates to the culture and to performance. Right, the pandemic has accelerated that growing acceptance that culture, diversity, and inclusion as real business applications and is viewed less as the so-called soft topic. So you've talked a little bit about why you felt you know this book needed to be written now, but you also in the book talk about messaging beyond the converted. So if you could talk to what does that mean? Uh, Catherine, why don't you touch upon what the converted um, represents? Well, the, the converted are the people who are, you know, know that it's good for business. So not only on a, a fairness perspective, but also if you look at the data, if you look at um, data from McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group, places with more diverse leadership make more money. So it's a kind of a bit of a zero sum game, isn't it? And yet, you know, and, and, and the, the reason why you get the non-converted is because some of the framing, because um, Sue's got a great analogy around this, which is it's almost like there's a, everyone goes to work and thinks there's a pie and the pie is this definitive size. And actually if the pie gets shared out with more people, your, your pie will get smaller. Actually, if you're talking about diversity and inclusion, you're not talking about making your share of the pie smaller. You're talking about baking bigger pies because your company will be more profitable and it is more sustainable. And, uh, you know, you'll attract a more you'll, you'll attract a broader range of talent than just the same old, same old. So your non-converted are those people who feel either threatened by the situation because of the way it's framed um, or they feel that they are scared of being wrong you know they're scared of uh, of saying the wrong thing and 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 quite often there's a there's a top down sort of dissemination of messaging which is just not recognizing some of the humanity around it which is fear or um you know just concern as well you know and so there's a whole thing around the non-converted they're not bad people they're just people who don't know all the upside that there is in them for these situations. I love the word converted because all too many times I've been sitting in a room 
it's almost like I'm preaching to the choir. It's the same individuals who want to be involved, but already understand the importance. Um, Mark, you touched upon something a bit earlier um, that I'd like to expand on. And that's the um, truth that white men still represent 85% of senior leadership in most companies and will never drive long-term change for women and minorities without active male allyship. So what can be done? What's the messaging? How do we make them feel less threatened? And for those that want to raise their hand, they don't know what to do. Well, I think the, the, the first thing that I think is, is relevant here is that this fascinating statistic that rough, and I won't get the exactly the right figure, but roughly 40% of straight white men cover at work. And for anyone who doesn't know the terminology, that means they fail to show up as themselves at work. They cover aspects of their personality because they do not think they fit in, uh, it, they would fit in if they were just themselves. So you've got 40% of straight white men thinking, I do not fit into this current patriarchal, uh, you know, um, alpha male culture. I would like it to change. So a huge block of people who you might currently think are the resistance to change are just not. They're ready to play a part in changing, changing the culture. And I think it's about giving them the techniques to feel that it's okay to stand up and talk about this. And you know, we do that in the book and, and, and it might sound a bit airy-fairy to say, oh, I teach emotional intelligence. I mean, this is a tough, a tough subject here. What good's that gonna do? But it is about helping people to manage their emotions and manage the anxiety and the uncomfortableness that comes with having these conversations so that they can just talk about things that they previously haven't talked about. And it is also, what we also have to do is we have to understand that change has to come from the very top. We need CEOs driving this change because the minute that happens, the minute people can see that the CEO wants this to happen, everybody underneath, you know, there's a weight lifted. Well, I can talk about this because I can see what direction the company's going in and I can be part of a conversation that I know it's okay to have. So you need to see leadership from the very top. And um, I love the fact that you have the word commercial in your job title, because the other, another thing we've got to do is stop thinking that, 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 that this is just a sort of a people issue or an HR issue. And that we're just, we're just sorting out some, some issues with our people here. We'll soon, we'll change the pipeline. It'll all be fine. It's not about that. It, it is about that, but it's also about your products and your services. Are they designed for a diverse audience? Are they inclusive? Is your marketing speaking in a genuine and empathetic way to diverse audiences? It's the whole thing. And if you can do that, then you can. You're, what you're doing is you're future-proofing your company. And once I think we get the conversation in that area, I think a lot more people who've currently stayed out of this conversation will go, you know what, I belong in that conversation. If this is about that, I can talk about it. Mark, I totally agree. I believe those, and I call it those courageous conversations are critical. Mm. And, you know, Sue, I'm gonna turn to you for a moment because in your book, you state that one in four employees in the US feel they don't belong. In the UK, it's one in three. Mm. However, the stats are clear, right? Companies that have diverse teams perform better. Mm. So why is inclusion, or the word you use, belonging, is really considered in the strategies for the workplace? And it's such a mistake. So how do you account for that when more diverse, inclusive organizations outperform the market? I think that's such a good it's such a good question. And I, I I agree with you, it's it's astonishing. I mean, I believe if a survey came out and, and it said that um, having uh, blue carpets in every boardroom drove profits by 25%, I think we'd see a spike in blue carpet sales and it would be a lot faster than 
having a more diverse senior management and yet those profitability improvements are proven through survey after survey, research after research, to be of that kind of consequence. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. So first, it's that it is often outsourced to a head of people or a head of diversity, and however brilliant they are, I mean, I've actually just written a, a, a blog for campaign, which is almost what does digital transformation and a culture of belonging, what do they have in common? And the answer is don't simply give someone a title, give them the job, however good they are, however crucial they are. You cannot make this one person's responsibility. It has to be the responsibility of everybody. And half in the same research, we find out that half the working population don't believe that their leader takes personal responsibility for diversity and inclusion. Now, I wonder what proportion would believe that they took personal responsibility for the profitability of the company, for the turnover of the company, for the sales of the company. So it needs to be something, as Mark said, that the leaders of the company take on board. But I actually do think there's another problem as well. And that's that the inclusion industry is almost become an industry that excludes the very men who are currently in power. And we had a number of conversations with CEOs and many of them were straight white men, middle-aged men, because there's more straight white middle-aged men CEOs than there are anything else. And they said privately to, to us, you know, Sue, Catherine, I have to tell you that I am, the, the, the stakes of doing or saying the wrong thing are so high, if I misspeak, it is so unforgiven that it is better for me to appoint somebody to do this job, to give them every support, but to not take personal responsibility, not speak up about it myself. So I would say that it is crucial for the senior people in an organization to take responsibility for this, but I would equally say everybody in the organization needs to take responsibility for it because whilst we're at that level of being so unforgiving, it's very hard for people not to be frozen. And there's this phenomenon called diversity fatigue, and we think it affects people in two ways. So it affects people who the diversity initiatives are for, because they're tired of being yet another poster person for whatever the diversity campaign of the month is, the person, the disabled person, or the, or the, or the you know, the black and ethnic min or ethnic minority person, or, or whatever it is. They don't want to be yet another person going on stage. Catherine did a great panel with um, someone who now runs a business that encourages diversity in companies. That's his job, he's a consultant. And he said, I go into those boardrooms and I want to say to the board directors, where were you when I was looking for a job at your organization three years ago because you wouldn't see me then, right? So that's one side of diversity fatigue is people who are tired and angry from that angle. But I think the other angle is the people who are currently in power, who are tired of not having actually any understanding from everybody about how difficult their journey can be as well. And this, this feels like it's almost a radical thing to say, but everybody has to have emotional intelligence and no leader, this is one of my personal bugbears, no leader, because I think this has got worse, no leader is infalli infallible. I mean, I've known Duncan even be wrong about things sometimes, I mean, hard <laughs> as it is to believe. Unless your boss is the Pope, and even then, but let's not go there, he or she is not infallible. We need to allow that in our leaders. We need to allow for, um, I am on a journey because we are all on a journey. Occasionally people misspeak and it needs to be possible to say, I've learned something, I won't do that again. I'm gonna make this commitment and make these improvements. And Catherine, I don't know if you want to tell the great story about um, uh, Andrew, who um, saw us talk and then changed how he behaved with his colleagues as an example of this. Yeah. So Andrew is a, a really lovely man. And uh, if you'd have asked Andrew whether he was a committed feminist and, and, and a human orientated, he would have said, yes, absolutely. You know, I don't I don't see any change. I just see people as people, you know, really. He is genuinely a really, really lovely man. And um, 
he came to see one of our talks and he said when he read, you know, that it was the glass wall success strategy, he said he thought, well, that's fine, isn't it? You know, I'm I'm on the side of I'm on the side of right here. I've, I've got nothing to be worried about. You know, I, I, it's all going to be fine. And then obviously in, we did our talk and we talk about examples of behavior, the way that women are treated. And then afterwards, there was a session where you turned to someone next to you and said, you know, well, what did you learn from that? And there was a sharing, um, it, you know, experience. And the woman next to him said, oh, well, you know, this is a really, really great talk. But, um, you know, obviously I, I work in a company and I'll, I'll, I, I really want to be managing director, but I'll never be managing director there. He said, well, why not? She said, well, they just don't promote women. He said, what? She said, well, they just don't promote women. And he said, during the course of the day, you know, as, as part of kind of people sharing post our talk, he said all of this revelation came to him about the way that women were treated. And he thought, well, you know, none of this behavior goes on around with, with me. Following week, he went back to work. They just done all of their, you know, graduate intake. There was a drink uh, for all of the graduate intakes. He's standing with a bunch of men and the men he's standing with start saying oh tell you what um that the one over there in the blue dress she's very pretty isn't she crikey you know glad to see that no comment like that about the men and he said I thought to myself I've got to say something I can't this is just like the slippery slope I've got to say something so he said um, guys why are we why are we talking about the women grads like this you know we're not we're not talking about the boys are we we're not talking about the men there's no comment there, you know, how, how strange is that? How do you, you know, a bit kind of like, how would you feel like that was your sister or, or, or one of, you know, one of your friends? And they all went, and he said, I thought this is just going to go very badly wrong. And they all turned around and went, yeah, you're right. Actually, we shouldn't talk about them like that. Anyway, about the football, we're going to absolutely smash it. And it was just like that. And he thought it was such a momentous moment. And actually some of it is just, he said, you know, it's, it's just that it's just patterns sometimes and you need to break that pattern and you need to change the conversation. And and it takes he said he was a bit scared, but he'd been there a period of time. And he said it was literally nothing said. And it's never happened again. You know, and it is the thing about empowering people to feel that you can just put your hand up and say, do you really think we ought to be doing this? Because sometimes to Sue's point. People just say stuff because it's just pattern and habit. And, and, and we've got to be human and be, you know, one of the things about the book, it's a better, kinder workplace. We have to be kind to each other and realise that we're not always right all the time and that we, are, we do need to kind of create these better workplaces together as a whole, from the CEO to the new grad covered a lot of ground with these two stories. And I have to say, you know, there's a common phrase, you know, you should bring your authentic self to the workplace. And to your point, everyone has a story and everyone has a history and they're all on a different path of the journey. And for this belonging or inclusion, we really have to be able for people to feel welcome, valued and respected yeah, while representation is important, it alone does not guarantee equity and inclusion. Uh, clearly, there is a lot more work to do. Which brings me to another question. Um, when I think about, again, here and now, we're in the pandemic, we're all in lockdown, right? So in the past, we would go to the office and we'd have social engagement and contact. Now we're in a virtual world work environment and it's can be very difficult for the employees um, to relate, to feel included, right? Yeah. So, you know, leadership must be able to over communicate, set, you know, clear expectations. Mark, I'm going to ask you, like, what cultural changes need to happen in this environment specifically to create this culture of belonging? Uh, I think it's incredibly difficult. I think the upside is the fact that you're asking that question and that everybody is asking that question. 
there is when things are quote normal there is an assumption that culture just happens that you don't have to build a positive culture you, you, you will just have a culture uh, and that's not true so we now have a situation where at least people people are acknowledging they have to do something to make the right culture happen so that's a starting point and that's welcome it's ex extremely hard because everyone is in a different situation uh, and different uh, environment with different challenges. Now, of course, that's not untrue in an office situation either, but it's more marked at the moment. So the first thing is you need an extraordinary amount of uh, communication from leadership on everything. And um, uh, I'm going to forget, somebody famously once said, if you haven't said it 10 times, you haven't said it. And I cannot remember which authority said that, but I, um, I pass that on to anyone, any leader that I coach. You, if you haven't said it 10 times, you haven't said it. You, you think you've said it enough, you haven't said it enough. Keep your fo clear focus messages about what you want the culture to be and how you want people to treat each other. Repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. But the truth is, I don't think we know yet because we're learning as we go through this and the situation keeps changing. So I think that constant communication, constant two-way communication is vital and a real understanding that we can't make assumptions about how people are reacting to the pandemic and working from home because everyone is going to react differently. Some people will find advantages in it, some people will find disadvantages, most people are going to find a mix. And I think that the, the really important thing to do at a team level is ask questions and just keep talking to each other and find out what's going on. And again, this is one of those things that is true, even if we're all in an office in a normal situation, teams should talk to each other and find out. One of my uh, team building exercises, I don't do, you know, letting people fall back into your arms or white water rafting. My team building exercises are about talking to each other. And one of my most important questions when you're building a team is everyone should say, this is what I'm like on a good day. This is what I'm like on a bad day. And when I'm having a bad day, this is this kind of support that I would like. And that might be, please help me in a practical way. That might be, please check in with me. But for some people, it's for God's sake, leave me alone. And it's important to know what everybody wants. And it's important for everybody to talk about what they're like on a bad day and to acknowledge that they have bad days and for the whole team to have that conversation about each other. And, and I think that would be a really useful exercise. Uh, and some of this is in, in some a lot more detail of that in the book, but these kind of questions to get every group of people who work together either continuously or on a project to share those comments about themselves and those thoughts about themselves would help to build a positive culture amongst those group of people and the kind of culture more generally. So this is such an important topic, you know, that I would really like for you to share what action should organizations take to implement this and create this culture of belonging, knowing that We've heard the word of unconscious bias that is inherent. Um, so what can we do both immediately and long-term? It's, it's a good question. I think understand where you are now, because unless you know where you are now, it's very difficult to move on. So um, certainly some of the things that we've put in place at Mediacom, which we're sharing with the industry at large, we did a big belonging survey for the whole, all of the WPP in the UK actually, which asked everybody questions about belonging and questions about how they felt about um, how they were, how they showed up at work. That was very interesting. And Mediacom came out well out of it actually, above average. But even at Mediacom, you would see a difference, for example, in how a um, young black woman felt about diversity and inclusion policies in the company versus a straight white man. Right? So, so understanding that detail, I think, is very important. So situational analysis is really good. We don't believe in quotas for the book. We do believe that diversity drives profits, but we do believe in targets. 
And I think the important thing here is the devil is in the detail. So targets, not just for the company overall for five years, but detailed targets by quarter, by, by division that will make, that will see change happen. I think that there is, there has to be a commitment right from the top of the company, from the full exco, from the full leadership team, not just we'll support the people team in the culture, but, or the div chief diversity officer, but their own commitments. And um, they need to show up and, and talk about this themselves. Um, it is not enough to kind of hide behind a policy. And in terms of training, we've introduced um, in the last, uh, last year, two pieces of training, a microaggressions workshop, which was mandatory for everybody, which in itself was a revelation. So at the microaggressions workshop that I attended, and uh, there were about 200 people there, but it was, it was very, and it was on Zoom, but it was still very good. And what I saw happen were, as we were talking about microaggressions and what they were, and you know, it's a relatively new term to many people, you would get perhaps a straight white man from a Northern working class background who'd go, oh, okay. So when people wind me up for this, this and this, and actually in a deep rooted sense, I don't think it's funny. I actually find it off putting. That's a microaggression. And, and the moderator would say, yes, that's a microaggression. Do you understand now how some other people feel? So that was very important in terms of opening up people's ideas to what, what that is, because it's a bit of jargon, frankly, at the moment. When I first heard the term microaggressions, which was a couple of years ago, I was intrigued by it. I wasn't, I, 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 I was, became aware that yes, I've been subject to microaggressions in my career as well. And that there is a much lesser known term that was coined by the same person that coined that term, which is the microaffirmation. And the microaffirmation is when you welcome people. It's when you in, are inclusive of people. It's when you take people who are underrepresented in the workplace and you comment on how great their contribution has been. I mean, in a real way, obviously, um, and make sure that they are included. And I had, I was a recipient of a microaffirmation myself because, um, I mean, Mediacom is a great place to work, but nowhere is perfect. And I was in a very, uh, very uh, sort of, tense meeting about a pitch it was a global pitch and um we were i was the only woman in the meeting which is rare at mediacom and there was lots of discussion about who we should put on the pitch for this particular very key client and i said at a certain point in the meeting i said i i i, I tell you who i think would be brilliant for it i think catherine would be brilliant for this and i talked about why and the meeting progressed nobody really took much notice of what i said and about 10 minutes later the most senior man in the meeting said i've had a brainwave about who we should Put on this pitch there's only one person it should be it should be Catherine now frankly I would have just let that go I just I mean I might have said oh where did you get that idea you know smiling to myself but I wouldn't have said anything but one of the other men and then all of the other men in the meeting just said did you not hear what Sue said did you not hear that Sue actually literally said 10 minutes ago let's put Catherine on it and it it, it they raised it and it was, it was a micro-affirmation. It was kind of, you know, they noticed, they didn't let it lie. So my biggest single piece of advice is personally and corporately, do not be a bystander. Be an active ally. So the other piece of mandatory training that we've done for everybody is active allyship training because it's easier said than done. So quite often, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I clearly don't know all the sort of 90 odd hundred participants on this call. But I would like to lay a bet that all of us in one way, shape or form have been witness to a conversation where we somebody has said something that we know has made somebody feel uncomfortable. And it might be, you know, advertising is full of banter. It might be this banter term. And, you know, one man's banter is another person's hideous put down. And for one reason or another, because we don't want to be the person that's always stopping the so-called fun and or, you know, because perhaps because the person who's, you know, made the remark is responsible for our pay rises and our promotion. And we don't want to kind of cause a great scene. We've let something go past. If tomorrow we all 
pledge that we will always speak up and we will always find a way of saying something, then I think the workplace becomes better for everybody overnight. And I think if, if we all do it, then it will spread. So um, that's my that's my big hope, actually, is, is that this caring for each other more that the pandemic has, has caused will not be just token, won't be just while we're still on lockdown, that for life after lockdown, we will consider to consider our, each other's emotional well-being and we will speak up for each other. I totally agree. Um, and those sentiments, I hope folks hear it loud and clear. But I have a question. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of years working with our clients, very, you know, diverse organizations. And it's not uncommon from the top of the house, the most senior leaders understand and recognize the importance of DE&I. They've gone through the microequities training, the unconscious bias training, but yet the flow of information to cascade down into the organization sometimes is a miss. And we've heard the term, you know, the frozen middle, the layer of middle management where they're still not getting it. So Catherine, I'd like for you to elaborate in terms of how do we get to the other levels within the organization on these importance of belongings, you know, and these conversations or the, the appropriate conversations that should be taking place? Well, I, I think it comes from, to Mark's point about people talking about how they feel without feeling that or, or, or what they're sensing around them without feeling they're being judged. Because quite often, in some organisations that Sue and I have done a, done talks at, it is just this stumbling down the same old path because no one's told them another way of, of working. So it does feel like it's top down and it's not been thought about. And it is about us recognising that people are, you know, in organisations, you, you turn up to work and, and it is very weird, isn't it? Sue and I have talked about, and Mark and I have talked about in the past, you know, we go and spend the majority of our week with actually a bunch of total strangers based on what? Three hours of chat with people. And we commit to spending most of our life with them. In fact, we spend normally more time at work than we do at home. And we turn up, we don't know what those people are like, you know, we think that they're all right, but I mean, it's probably never happened to you, Frida, but I've almost certainly gone to, you know, you're probably better at researching, but I'm almost certainly gone to an interview, sat down, looked at the job description and thought this will be really great. Looked at the people across the table and thought, I'd literally rather put pins in my eyes than spend 10 more minutes with you, you know, and had to do the, I'm sorry, I've just remembered I'm meant to be somewhere else after 20 minutes of the interview. Cause it's just, you know, that whole thing where you get the feel. And I think for that, you know, the, 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 the frozen middle, it is the fact that we have to recognize those pinch points for them. And we need to have the conversation about why, and, and, in a, and in a kind way and in an empathetic way about why it is good for them and why it is not about them not being relevant or not being able to play a part. I think it is, it's the whole thing about when we say about everybody in the workplace take, taking part, they sometimes feel it's happening to them rather than they are part of it. If we make them part of it, then they feel empowered and they feel it is their conversation and they feel that they can be a beneficiary and also someone who can make it happen. And, and so often if we turn situations into fear or threat, everyone reacts in a very primal way. Whereas if we turn around and say to people, you want to work at a company that is successful and has a great culture where people are treated with kindness the way you'd like to be treated. Well, by joining in with this, this is the culture you're going to create and you can be a part of it. So it happens. You are part of the change rather than the change being forced upon you or it kind of forwarding around you. So like you're a rock and it's happening around you and you just get increasingly isolated. Actually, you can be part of something bigger than you, which people really, you know, 
we are pack animals. So if you feel that you're part of a, a certain direction, how joyous is that? Much better than sitting there in your room tutting about all these changes going on around you. You can be part of the change. I and it's about us being kind to those people as well and recognizing that sometimes it is difficult for them. It, you know, Duncan's made a point as well in, in, in the chat about if you've never worked for a woman, you know, how it can be really quite stressful and it makes you defensive and you interpret the way that people talk to you in a certain way rather than thinking actually you know this could be great and I could learn things it's a it's a way of framing the conversation and making people feel that, that it's their conversation as well I do love your example and I was smiling to myself um the recollection of a potential candidate thinking they're perfect for the job and then in the interview process going, oh no, under no circumstances. And what's so important about that story is that the next generation, the millennials are so cognizant of the culture of an organization, right? And they certainly want to ensure when they look at the corporate landscape that it is diverse and it is inclusive and there's so much more important to them than just a job. So absolutely. Um, our audience is really interested in hearing from each of you if you have a favorite or memorable passage or quote from your book or a lesson that you learned that, you know, something they can put into good use as they go back and reflect on this conversation. So whoever would like to start. Um, can, <laughs> All right, can, Mark, I'm gonna call on you. I feel like- Can I, I answer the, can, <laughs> can I, so the, the, the second thing you said there, something you can take back and use, okay? Because yep. I want to, if I was more organized, I would have shared this chart with you beforehand and you'd be able to put it up properly. I've just scribbled it on a post-it note. So that's the change equation. D times V times F has to be greater than R. And this is really important. Okay. So D is dissatisfaction with the status quo. Uh, the, the V is a vision, a positive vision of the future. F is first steps, actionable first steps, and R is resistance. So for a change to happen, D times V times F has got to be greater than the resistance. Now we know we've got D, we've got a lot of dissatisfaction with the status quo. In fact, that's probably too mild a word, but I'm gonna stick with the terminology of the equation. What's not there yet, and it's just my opinion, is the V and the F. We have a focus on correcting mistakes, which is absolutely necessary and has to be done, but it's not, it's a negative sounding thing and that, that will make necessary alterations, but it will not drive long-term change because leaders are not creating a positive vision of the future. Where, what are we heading towards? Not what are we trying to get rid of, but what are we heading towards? What does it look like and why is it wonderful? And the other thing that's missing is the F. And this I think is an answer also to the question about the frozen middle. The frozen middle doesn't know what is the thing it's supposed to do tomorrow to move in the right direction. So I think uh, a leadership that wants a real change here has to work really hard to promote a positive vision but they also have to make sure that every single individual in the organization knows what is their individual first step? What is the action they're supposed to take to move the culture in the right direction? And I think if you get all of that right, then I think we overcome the resistance and we make more progress. So I think that equation is what I'd like you all to take away with you as a, as a thing to think about uh, the V and the F. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some good insight there. Catherine, do you have a favorite passage, quote, or lesson you'd like to share? Well, my one of my favorite things and the thing that I use very frequently is Mark's breathing exercise, because I think it's um, Mark does great breathing exercise uh, that we do in the talks. And it is that thing where it is 
<laughs> when you're feeling very emotional and these circumstances can make you feel emotional, um, his breathing exercise it's, um, is great because it calms you down and it gives you a central focus. Um, Mark probably doesn't want to do it now and I'm not as good at, at, at doing it as he is, but I've almost certainly used it and I have also mentored people. I'm currently mentoring three young women and I've, I've told them about it because it is just, you know, the idea of just holding your breath and centering yourself for a moment can take the, your emotions are still there, but it takes the edge off them. And I think sometimes we're scared of the emotion around this conversation. We're, we, we get scared of it and it, it ends up us not having honest conversations because we're worried we're going to lose control. And this way you don't lose control. So that's my favorite thing. That's great. So I'm going to. That's so the, the equation is <laughs> you breathe in for four, you hold your breath for seven, and then you breathe out for eight. <laughs> it's brilliant. So, so I'm going to hold off on um, flipping the question to you because we do have a question from the audience that I want to make sure we get to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to pose this to you, right? So the individual would like advice in what kind of sessions would be useful to go through with the demographic that might be able to push the needle to ensuring dynamic young people don't have following the stereotypes um, and creating that sandwich effect in the training for the top down. So one of the things that surprised me about the quant research that was done for us by a company called Donata for the book was how the under 25s are well, they don't feel like they belong in the workplace, but they are bemused by the things in the workplace that the rest of us take for granted. So there, there were other underrepresented groups that I expected to see SKUs with, but when it comes, for example, to experiencing bias, harassment, or inappropriate behavior at work, overall, one in three, which is not great, but in the US, 50%, of under 25s have experienced this, not witnessed it, just not heard about it, but experienced it. Um, and it, it, in the UK, it's, it's one in three again, but it's, it's even higher in, in the US. And I think that things that perhaps more seasoned people in the workplace have taken for granted, that generation who have a different attitude as you pointed out to work anyway, and to, you know, who do consider some things in a different way, so see gender is more of a spectrum than some older cohorts do, they are not going to put up with this kind of thing. I am a big believer in reverse mentoring. So I have a brilliant reverse mentee, Sasha, who is uh, very different from me. And he and I, during the course of this lockdown, actually, we'd established a relationship anyway, but I found him so helpful during this um, uh, period of lockdown and in fact I've been able to get kind of empathy and support from him in a way that sometimes is harder from my immediate colleagues because they are you know all coping with a million things as well and he's kind of got the time and the space for me and then of course I am able to give him you know it's not even necessarily wisdom it's just if he hits a, a, a problem I might well have experienced it. You know, it's just because after this amount of time at work, you kind of feel like you've experienced most things. So I think reverse mentoring would be a really good scheme for um, uh, those young mm. professionals. And it would also be super beneficial for the people at the top of the company. And in a way, it is one of the things that I was gonna say how I take out of the book is we spend a lot of time talking about allyship but also sponsorship um, mentoring um, having a wingman or a wingwoman having someone that you can go to outside of this organization the immediacy of what's going on with you and get some really honest advice and in fact I mean Duncan despite the fact he would have hated the idea of it I have considered as a mentor throughout my career and there have been points where the advice that he's given me has been career changing um, and it's not advice that I would have got from someone within my organization because Duncan was always able to go just to see the bigger picture, to just have perspective. Um, but find a wing woman, find a wing man, find a mentor, find a sponsor. They don't even have to agree to do it. Just you know, have a chat with them. 
that I think is a is a is a major um, thing to take from the book. It's interesting that you talked about reverse mentoring. Literally at Broadridge, we just launched a reverse mentoring for our executive leadership team to be working with diverse high potentials from our affinity groups. So it'll be interesting and we'll have to come back and chat of how that, you know, what that looks like and what learnings were taken away from those elements. Um, we're almost out of time, but I will tell you, we could spend another hour or two having this discussion, but I feel like um, we're talking to the choir Right? <laughs> so we all here appreciate the importance and relevance and there's so much more work that needs to be done. There's an opportunity here for everyone to continue learning, growing when it comes to DE and I. Um, I wanna thank all of you, Mark, Sue, Catherine. It's been my pleasure um, talking with you here and prior to. And Duncan, I'm gonna turn it over to you to wrap us up. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Frida, and uh, it, I'm available as a career coach. I think I think usually the transaction involved involved at least one glass of wine, so that's that's yeah. my price. Um, uh, I'd just like to say a huge thanks to to Frida for you did a brilliant job moderating brilliant. this conversation. I knew I knew it would be a fantastic uh, conversation with this group, uh, but Frida, fa fabulous job, and for everybody who's still on the call. Uh, if you haven't already uh, got a copy of Belonging, you should. Uh, there's a huge amount of practical help in this book and uh, there's a discount code available. We'll send it around to everyone who's attended this uh, call today. So if you didn't get a chance to see the code in the chat, we'll send it around afterwards. Um, so we'll be continuing to address this subject throughout the year as we was as our STIR program on both sides of the Atlantic continues. And I'd just like to thank the panel once again and for everybody for joining us today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Have you. A good day.